I'm Ernie Humphrey, the Vice President of Educational Programs for Performative, the online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. First, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar, Target Your Next Job. An effective job search can easily take more than 40 hours a week. You can't afford to waste your time applying for jobs that are not the right fit for your skills or to companies that do not offer you the right cultural fit. That you have a quality personal marketing campaign so that engaging the right people at the right companies in the right way to land the right job that you really want. The main objectives of this webinar uh, are to offer you practical and actionable advice in discovering your best job opportunities, engaging the right people within your targeted companies, and developing an effective personal marketing plan. A quick note on today's agenda, we will hear a presentation from a longtime corporate finance leader and certified career coach, and then we will move to a question and answer segment where we will spend the remainder of our hours. We would like this to be an interactive experience for you, so if you have any questions at any time, please go to the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel and send us your questions. We can't promise to get all of them in, but we will do our best and we'll follow up afterwards with any questions we did not get to. A few logistical notes, we will be sending out a link to the soft copy of this presentation to all attendees with, later today, and we are also offering CPE credits for the CPAs in today's audience. Uh, there will be a final slide of the presentation that will contain the contact information for a certification manager in case you did not check the box to get CPE credit on the way in today. Okay, let's go ahead and get started by introducing our speaker, uh, Moshe Kravitz, He's a certified 5 o'clock club career coach. Moshe guides his clients in selecting appropriate targets and in marketing themselves effectively. His experience includes many years as an educator, actuarial positions at CNA Insurance and Buck Consultants, and his position as director of FPNA at a major telecommunications energy company. Everywhere he works, Moshe demonstrates a passion for helping others to improve their skills and efficiency. With this passion, he helps job seekers to hone their job search skills, enabling them to land offers more quickly and effectively. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Moshe. Moshe? Good morning. Thank you for coming. As you see on the first slide, our goal today is to target your next job, learn to develop your personal marketing plan. Let's meet George. George had been the CFO at a major publishing company, and he'd been looking for a job for a year, and he had worked with several career coaching organizations before he came to the 5 o'clock club. First question that George was asked when he came to 5 o'clock club for help was, George, how many interviews have you had with people at a level high enough to be able to hire you? George said, none. Okay, next question to George. How many positions are there in your target? What? Well, George, how many people are there doing what you do? Uh, CFO, I'm a CFO. There's only one CFO per company. Okay. How many major publishing firms are there in your in your area? Um, seven. Uh -huh. So, George, there are seven positions in your target. George, we'd like you to know that our research has determined that it takes about 200 positions to be able to have a reasonable chance of landing a job. If George is targeting seven positions, uh, he'll probably have to live a few lifetimes in order for the odds to work out that one of those positions should open up and be offered to him. Now, this 200 positions is um, not really uh, a f fixed in stone number. It varies. It varies with a few factors. In a difficult economy, a person will have to target more than 200 positions uh, in order to have a reasonable chance of getting an offer. But um, even if it's a good economy, if a person is looking for a position in a declining industry, he'll need to target more than 200 positions. On the other hand, even in difficult economic times, if a person is targeting an expanding industry, then he can target fewer than 200 positions. What's so bad about declining industry? Well, 
since revenues are decreasing, clients are decreasing, therefore um, staff is decreasing, meaning there's not many hiring opportunities and nor advancement opportunities. And those people who are still remaining, they locked out and didn't get laid off, feel tremendous pressure, maybe they're next. Um, that causes strained relationships among even the best of working associates. And all the opposite is true by an expanding industry. So when you're targeting positions to the extent possible, you like to target an expanding industry or at least a stable industry and not a declining industry. A few examples I can tell you from first-hand experience when I worked in pension consulting. So everyone knows that and every year there are fewer and fewer defined benefit plans in existence than there were the pre previous year. <coughs> plans are frozen, the companies are merged into another company and the pension plan is merged. Um, people change over to a less expensive uh, defined contribution plan and so they need fewer actuaries. And all the symptoms that we just described are present in the pension consulting industry. Um, the landline phone service is a declining industry. AT&T, the phone company, now bills itself as a service and entertainment provider because landline is a declining industry. Some expanding industries, just a few, medical supplies and pharmaceuticals, even though they may have their ups and downs, um, generally experience year-over-year -year growth. Back when I was in um, pensions, one type of um, annual analysis we would do would be for the medical retirement that are offered, medical retirement benefits offered to retirees, and we'd have to look back and project forward uh, projected increases in medical costs. Medical costs always have been increasing for many, many years back and as far as far out in the future as we could see in double digits, 12, 14 percent year over year. That's an expanding industry. And now, after um, recent government regulation, compliance has become a big industry. And risk management companies like LinkedIn and Facebook um, are, are where you see a lot of growth. Um, what about George? Let's see if we can help George to expand his number of targets uh, and target maybe close to 200 positions. So what defines the target? First and obviously the job function. He's a CFO. If he can expand upon that and par perhaps do some related types of activity. Maybe George interested to be a CEO. Maybe he can be a controller, VP of finance, etc. More job functions means more positions that George will be targeting, increasing the likelihood of getting an offer. Now, he said he works in major publishing. If he'll expand the definition of his industry or include other industries, that could give him more positions. Um, maybe he'll work for a smaller publishing firm. Industry could be defined in this regard, not only as the specific product that you're involved with, but whether you, let's say, it's a, looking, you're targeting a bigger or a small company for profit, a not-for-profit, public, non-public, etc. All these things could be included in the industry uh, criteria for the positions that you're looking for. So if George will look for, um, let's say, a, a printing industry or small publishers, then he'll have more positions to target. And finally, the third thing which defines a target, you have your job function, you have the industry, and you have the geography. And if he wants to stay exactly where he is and not move, maybe he'll commute a little farther and thereby expand his geography. If he's willing to move, he can expand his geography even farther. These are the three drivers which define and limit the number of positions that might be available. You move any one of them and you can be targeting more positions. <clears throat> now let's make it very clear that when we talk about targeting 200 positions, it does not mean 
200 openings. Let's go back to George. There were seven positions that he was targeting. They may have been all filled. Doesn't matter. Because we're not chasing openings. We're pursuing positions. And let's see the ramifications of that statement. Since it's known that not all jobs are ever are advertised. Most jobs are never advertised. Those jobs that were publicized, either through ad advertisements, be it print, be it online, whatever, or publicized even through recruiters, all of those all together will account for 10 to 20 percent of all jobs that were offered. The other 80 percent, the hidden job markets, were never offered. So a person who's targeting openings spends all of his time focusing on 10 to 20 percent of the market, 10 to 20 percent of the opportunities. Not very efficient. Now what's the range 10 and 20? 20 percent is, let's say, for the middle level positions. 20 percent of them may be publicized. But as we get to the higher level positions, even fewer are publicized closer to 10% if you combine ads together with uh, recruiters, meaning 90% of the job market is hidden. So how do we find 200 positions to target? There are a lot of steps. It's an important question and takes work. It takes work, but it's not insurmountable and you can even enjoy it. The first step will be to brainstorm. You'll come up with many, many, many ideas. You can't have too many ideas because afterwards you will rank them, prioritize them, see which are more relevant to you, which are less relevant. After this compiling of an initial set of targets, you research them and see if they indeed are the way we thought initially that they would be, and then look for the specific companies within each target and individuals within each company. And finally, use all that information to write up and draft the step-by-step -step marketing plan. So let's go through these. When we say brainstorm, we mean not only on your own, but with the help of others, with your friends, with your family, with your trusted associates. Brainstorm and brainstorm all the possible jobs that you could do with your skill set. And uh, not only the things that occur to you initially, try to go out of the box. And um, I'll give you a few examples of um, I came across recently, last week, I saw a statistic that the apps economy in 2011 boasted 466,000 positions. It means not only the apps programmers, but all the chain up and down supporting those workers, 466,000, versus 2007 when there were zero positions in the apps economy. Had a person been doing his brainstorming back in 2007, would an apps economy job have appeared on his brainstorming list? Probably not. What about in 2008, 2009, 2010? At some point, your creativity and your keeping up with what's going on technologically uh, um, uh, with, with, with regulations, with the uh, environment, with economy, etc., can help you to anticipate new opportunities in the growing industries. Now, one very, very practical way to do this brainstorming is to start with an inventory of your skills and passions, and then from there, brainstorm all the possible jobs that you could do successfully using one or several of those skills and passions. How to compile that inventory of skills and passions was a subject we discussed at some length in a previous webinar. It's archived on Performative website. Uh, in very brief, you look back at your accomplishments that you enjoyed, that you were proud of, and drill in to see what skills did you use in achieving those accomplishments what drove you, what was exciting, what was fun about it, why did you enjoy it, and thereby compile an inventory of skills and passions. Do it for, uh, for a number of different accomplishments, 
and compile this inventory. Use that to brainstorm um, jobs that you could do successfully using those skills and passions. Now, there's two types of thinkers. There's lumpers and there's stringers. I remember hearing this from a genius Austrian professor, the head of artificial intelligence research back when I was in university as a math student. And uh, with his head in the clouds, he was down to earth and said there are, if this was a seminar on cognition, he said there are lumpers and stringers. Stringers are the analytical people, very logical, step by step. They will do well making this inventory of skills and passions and then thinking of jobs they could do based on that. The lumpers might do better with the following approach. Um, I call it like a tangential approach. Put down on a paper. What you do now is your job function in the center of the paper. And then think about those jobs within this job function, tangential to it, above it, below it, next to it, related to it. And then it'll give you other job functions which you may be able to do where you may be very valuable with your skill set to do something in that functional area. We'll give examples of both of these very soon. We mentioned use your friends and relatives and trusted associates to help you brainstorm. And another very, very powerful tool is every job possibility that you come up with. You can then take that, punch it into a job board, and see what comes up. You will get many hits using that exact job description, that job name, that job title, and you'll get many more where there's some variance, some slightly different job title, job function, and like this you can exponentially increase the number of ideas that you have by using the job boards to punch in all the jobs that you've thought of and see what comes up as related job functions. Now, a few examples. Let's look at an actuary. In blue we see here some of the major skills that an actuary might possess and work with. He might be involved in pricing, in setting reserves, and participating in plan design, helping with plan administration. Each of these skills now could be mapped to different job functions where he would be very valuable. Imagine underwriting an actuary. With his knowledge of pricing, how valuable he would be in an underwriting area or an insurance or punch and sales area. And he can take the pricing skill nowadays and use it in many, many other industries where pricing is becoming much more analytic, much more um, automated, uh, etc. Much more a technical skill, and, and etc. All these skills can be mapped to other job functions that an actuary could do. Here's the start of another one where you go to look at George, CFO and publishing. Listed are some of the skills that a CFO might have, and then I left for the reader to go ahead and map out what other jobs the person could do based on each of these skills. That is how it works. Let's look at the other type of example. I um, spoke recently with a client who's been 20 some years in treasury and we did this. A treasurer's job um, involves or borders on all of these various functions and um, he could anticipate position targeting positions in these various functions and if he still needs more to get to his 200 number he can do the same thing pick out any one of these boxes around the edge and do the same thing all the job functions which are tangential to that function okay so I think with this you can get yourself to at least 200 um, positions now 200 positions doesn't have to mean 200 different job functions. It means 200 people doing what you want to do within your industry, within your geographical limitation. Right? Let's say a simple example, a guy is out of school as a uh, programmer, wants an entry-level programming job in New York City. He'll, there's more than 200 people in New York City doing that. Right? If a person is a CFO like George for uh, major publishing, then uh, there may not be 200 people doing that. In his case, there were seven. Okay. So if he'll agree to be CFO of a, a printing company, maybe he'll add another 50 positions 
into by including that second target. And um, if he'll expand his geography, let's say, to be global, maybe he'll hit 200 positions of people doing those things within that geography. OK, so we have our 200. We need to rank them. We're not. We are not. We're never going to go and um, ramp up a marketing campaign for all of those different job possibilities that we brainstormed. For sure not. That was not the purpose of it. The purpose was to come to the next step and rank them and see which ones make the most sense for us. Um, so one of the criteria to use in ranking these job possibilities is see how each of these ideas would lead either in the direction or away from our career and personal goals. That's another thing we discussed in the previous webinar, webinar how to compile this written description of our career and personal goals. And we use that to help rank these job possibilities, which one more lead us towards our long-term goals. Another tool that we can use to rank our job possibilities is the grid. The grid means as follows. All these jobs that we brainstormed will write along the left side of a piece of paper or an Excel spreadsheet, if you like. And across the top, we put each of the skills, each of the passions that appeared in our inventory of skills and passions. And then we put a check, job idea number one. Check off those skills which would be used, those passions which would be used in that job function. Job idea number two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you do it in Excel, you can total <laughs> how many checks you have and then sort and rank and see uh, which jobs had the most amount, biggest amount of checks, and you can rank it like that. Other things that we can use to rank the uh, ideas we discussed, is it an expanding or declining industry? What would be the salary and growth potential in this particular job? How much retraining might I need in order to embark uh, on that position? And an important point, what's the culture? If I've been working in this industry X, and I'm now targeting a job in industry Y. What is, is the culture that I'm used to? What's the culture like over there? Will it be a fit? Will I will it bring out the best in me? Will I will be comfortable working over there? Very important factor. We can use that in ranking our job possibilities. Now, another important thing that we're talking about ranking is that uh, once we start picking out particular companies to apply to, there will be the companies that we would love to work for. Call those our A companies. Many companies that they're good. We'd be good to work for those. And those companies that we hope we never have to work there. Now, do not scratch those C companies off your list. They're very important for several reasons. And I'll tell you right now why. I had a client who told me the last time he interviewed for a job was four years ago, okay, would he want to go and target one of his A companies and make his first interview after 14 years at one of those companies? For sure not. Get some practice first. Contact some of your C companies. It's probably easier to get in over there. It's probably easier to get offers over there. Get some practice over there. Each time you interview, it gets better. It's iterative. Anytime you have to speak publicly. I try to give a, a presentation several times to friends before I give it uh, officially um, at, a, at a speech or at a webinar. It improves every time that you give it. So practice first on your C companies. Practice interviewing over there. And if you do, get some offers, even though you may hope that you don't have to work there. How much more valuable does that make you look in the eyes of the other companies? You go to a B company and you say, I have a few offers, but I don't want to accept anything until I speak with you because I would really like to work at this company. You know, as much as it enhances your status, the fact that you're currently employed, some employers today say if you're not currently employed, don't even bother to submit an application. How much more so? It enhances, and we're not saying there's any re rhyme or reason to that any logic to it. Yesterday he was employed, today he's not. He's the same quality worker, but that seems to be a bias among employers. 
anyway, how much more so it makes a person appear valuable and desirable when he's coming in already having a few offers in his hands. So the C companies are valuable, and then you work your way up to your B companies, to your A companies. Okay, we have our initial targets. Let's check them out and see if they are indeed what we think they might be. I'll tell you a quick example. When I was in high school, I, was, I enjoyed chemistry. So I thought, maybe, maybe I'll be a pharmacist. And I spoke <coughs> with a few pharmacists. I had a cousin in Detroit, and my English teacher's husband was a, was a pharmacist. And they both said, well, don't be a pharmacist. You take pills out of a big jar and you put them into a little jar, uh, it's pretty boring. And so that saved me from uh, making a big mistake. So you want to do research and see if your initial targets are indeed what you thought they might be. So here are some resources to use in doing that research. And once you start, you'll come across others. You can compile on your own <coughs> your own set of favorite resources. Indeed.com is not a job board, but it, it, uh, it's a search engine pulling from many job boards. But the reason why I'm pointing you to it is because it has a lot of industry information. And it's useful for that to go research industries, industries, salaries, etc. Vault is somewhat unique in that it provides um, a discussion from current or recent employees, people who are currently or were recently involved in a company, working in a company. They say what it, what it is like to work at that company. Virtual pet also provides tremendous industry information and guidance on how to do this research. Now, let's also not skip the obvious. Google, if you put an industry into there, you ask for associations within an industry, <coughs> you ask for information about industries, you get a wealth of information. Another obvious is once you're up to picking certain companies, read the company website, read their press releases, read their 10K. We're speaking to finance people for sure. Look at both the financials and the description of the industry and the challenges. Um, and a discerning person may be able to read carefully over here, read the lines, read between the lines, and prepare himself before meeting with the company to know what it says there, what it doesn't say there, what it should have said there, and be prepared to have intelligent discussion with people um, in the leadership of the company, uh, maybe addressing why something didn't appear there which you would have expected to appear. Um, if they left it out for not a good reason, it's deceptive practice, that gives you already a sense of what type of company you're dealing with. If it's by oversight, that gives you a different sense of the caliber of the company you're dealing with. Anyway, it can provide basis for intelligent discussion with the leadership of the company and analysis analyst reports. All these are obvious and very helpful to inform yourself about an industry and about a business. That was reading. There's two ways to do research. One is by reading. One is by talking. Talk to people who are in the industry. Talk to people who are in the company. These are several ways to find people in the industry, your alumni associations, um, obviously LinkedIn. And let's talk a little bit about networking. At this point, there's a lot to say about it. We'll leave most of it for another webinar. But at this point, use your networking. This is the beginning of your building your networking base, which will be the foundation of your entire job search. Networking is wasted if it's used merely to ask, um, uh, Joe gave me your name, asked, suggested I speak to you. Do you know of any openings? That's a waste. Um, rather, you need information right now. You want information about a certain industry, right? You say you tell the person that this is an industry that I'm contemplating. Uh, what could you tell me about the industry? What's the culture like? What are the opportunities like? Um, how long have you been in the industry? What's your function? Do you enjoy it? You can compile for yourself a list of questions that you ask 
these people who you begin to meet, you begin to network with, and at some point when you have already a list of um, tentative targets, you can ask your networking contact, are you familiar with these companies? Um, what's the culture like in these companies? What's the financial strength like in the companies? What's the atmosphere like to work in these companies? Um, would you know anybody in these companies whom I should contact? Could I use your name, etc.? This forms the basis of your job search. So talk to people. As we mentioned, in your target industries and people in the companies that you begin to target, um, some obvious targets in those companies, investors, board members, anybody in the C office, anybody who reports to them to get a feeling of what the issues are, what the challenges are, what the growth opportunities may be, what the culture is like in each particular company. Now, as far as finding the specific companies to apply to, there are many, many resources. We list a few for you over here. Hoover's and Reference USA is usually available um, through libraries. And you can search for companies by many, many different parameters, by size, by uh, SIC code, by industry, by location, etc. Jigsaw is an interesting resource. Um, you can put in a company and then ask to see uh, all the marketing people, all the finance people, all the managers, all the directors, all the C-levels in the company, and it brings you back names and contact information. Now, as with any database that provides contact information, there's no such thing as 100% completeness and 100% accuracy. Marketing people tell me that 50 to 60% completeness and accuracy on a list that you may purchase for making marketing contacts would be considered good. I spoke this week with Jigsaw, and they claim 75% accuracy. And I've been on there. I looked at my own company, and it looks quite plausible that it might be 75%. And they, they have a model where they incent the users to update the information, and that's probably why they achieve a somewhat higher degree of accuracy. I wish I had something which was 100% accurate to recommend. I don't know of anything. If anybody does, you'll do us a favor by suggesting it to us. Anyway, it is a, a way of getting the names of people in management positions in any given company. LexisNexis in one source usually available through corporate subscription if you have access to those things. And it gives you many, many, many profiles of executives and directors of different companies, giving a lot of information on these people. OK. With all of this information now available to us, we can sit down and write down our personal marketing plan. Looking for a job is a marketing activity. and it, it, we, it, it pays to be business-like about it and write a marketing plan. Um, we've ranked our companies. We've researched and found um, which companies to contact, who to contact. Now we have to put down um, which companies, whom to contact in that company, when to contact him, how to contact him, and track what happens. Track the date that I sent the correspondence track the date that I got the response, what did he respond, what did I answer back, keep track of it because <laughs> um, it, it's too much to keep in, in, in a person's head. Some clients have suggested that JibberJobber is a software which is very useful and an easier way to track all this information for a job search than keeping it on pages or on spreadsheets. Um, there's a free version, which they said is robust and adequate for this purpose. Whatever happened to George? To old George. Well, George did target more positions, and George got hired. There, uh, I have some more resources for anyone who would be interested. 
If you'd like to contact me, I'd be happy to email to you um, other resources that can be used in the job search pro process. And with it, I'd like to thank you for attending today. I hope that you found it interesting and useful, and we'll turn it over to Ernie. Uh, thank you very much, Moshe, for that for that very um, actionable advice and content. It's, it's very valuable. As we transition to the Q&A portion of the webinar, we're going to launch our polling questions. Please note that for those of you in the audience who are after CPE credit today, you'll need to answer both of the polling questions. As a reminder, if you have a question you would like to have answered by Moshe, please, please visit the questions area in your GoToWebinar panel and, and ask your question. I'm going to go ahead um, and get the Q&A session um, teed up so we make make the best use of our time here this morning and just please we'd appreciate it if you would uh, answer those questions. We'll leave each poll up uh, for two minutes. Uh, Moshe, our first question is is around the fact you mentioned that 80 to 90 percent of the jobs are unpublished. So can you give us some advice on how to go about accessing those unpublished jobs? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we've mentioned building your network. That is the way to do it and not targeting, as we said, openings, but developing relationship with people, an ongoing relationship with people. Right? You began conversation with this person, maybe a person to whom you were referred and suggested, maybe a person to whom you, uh, you, who you found and, and, and made the connection on your own, but you begin to get information about the industry. You keep in touch with the person monthly basis, every two months, provide information to him. You're doing research. You're learning things he may not even know about. Send him a link to an article or a webcast or something like that. Keep in touch with him. Keep yourself in his mind. Um, as you learn more, you can come back and ask um, higher level questions, um, more sophisticated questions. You'll find them challenging. You'll find them interesting. And building a network of at least six to ten people whom you keep in regular contact with, culminating in a network of people at a level who could offer you a job. And if they're looking at your back and saying, oh, we could really use somebody like that around here. I wish we had an opening. You keep that up, and eventually the openings start to come in. We discussed this a lot in a, in a later webinar, but that's, that's it in a nutshell. Okay, great. Um, next question um, is around, um, you know, how give us some advice on how to find the hiring manager or the right person to target for a specific job opportunity. Obviously, as you mentioned, I'm when you're ready to do that, but how do you go about finding that right person? Okay, so we mentioned in the webcast how to get names, contact names, but uh, your question is to find out who's the right guy. The best information to get is insider information. If you can somehow network into a company and get somebody who you know or who knows your friend and um, can tell you from the inside who is important over there, that's the best way to get it. And you may not necessarily want only who's the hiring manager, but it's very, very helpful to know who are the influencers. The influencers might be a superior to that hiring manager, might be uh, a peer, it might be somebody one or two or four levels below, somebody who's been around a long time, very respected for his knowledge. Who are the influencers in that company? And if you can get in contact with them, that can be very helpful to promote your case. OK, great. Um, we have a, a question um, from one of the attendees who mentions that uh, you know, he, is, he has uh, thought about you know, following your strategy of, of, of finding a job that might not uh, be the best fit. And it seems as if uh, there was a probably a senior level person who was offered a lower level job at, at about one third of the pay, wow. and, and, now, and now the person you know has been out of work for for a few months now. So so what is your uh, advice as far as you know uh, taking that job, and, and and then say if you take a lower job, is, is that going to affect your marketability uh, in the future? Yeah, unfortunately, it does. It does. Uh, it's tough. Okay, so yeah, so so as follow up, so so when you're you know when you're talking about 
you know, taking uh, that job, it, it, it seems like you're saying that maybe they should focus um, on the level of the job and then, and then maybe go down to that C-slot as far as the company, but, but it's, it's harder to compromise um, on your seniority level and expect to, uh, you know, to have that uh, keep your career momentum positive. Yeah, you know, when we saw there's a few different drivers in expanding the number of positions, right? One of which, and it's certainly not the first, is to, to go down a notch, right? When it's not as detrimental to go down a notch is if you're jumping industries, jumping industries or even jumping careers, right? Then uh, sometimes you have to go down a notch in order to get in. <laughs> you don't have the same value in a new industry or new career as you had where you currently are. However, there it's not so bad to go down a notch because you expect to make rapid progress based on your experience, based on your skills. You're going down as a, as a, like as a, as a way to get in, but you expect a rather rapid climb upwards as you quickly learn the new industry and, and become valuable over there as you were in your prior position. Okay, uh, thank you. Now we have uh, a couple of tactical questions on some of the areas uh, that you touched on. So one of the things you mentioned was valuable was to um, engage people that, that are in the same industry uh, that you're targeting. So someone just asking, um, sh is it best to reach out to people that have the same job title uh, they desire in the industry and then maybe some, some tactical ways uh, to make connections with those people? You want to know if you should contact people at the same level at um, a lower level, if it's if 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 it's within your own industry where you're already familiar, it makes it makes sense to contact people at that level, and or eventually hire because the people at your level may not be in the level to hire you. You may need somebody higher, right? So you want to eventually build your network of contacts up to a level of people even higher than those than your level. But yes. It makes sense to start at your level. If you're talking about moving to a new industry where you're not so familiar, it makes more sense to start out contacting people at a lower level because the type of questions you'll be asking are very basic. Answer those basic questions with people at a lower level. As you get more educated, you can ask more higher level questions and more strategic level questions. Then take those questions and, you, and use the valuable time of the higher level people and they'll find those questions more interesting and then um, be able to give you information at, at the level where only they could provide it. Okay, uh, great. And someone is asking, I would say, um, almost uh, an ancillary question and maybe you don't have any off the top of your head. So, so let's say you're, you know, you're targeting an industry. Um, are, are, you know, are there specific you know, places to go to find these people in the same industry, uh, would you recommend LinkedIn groups or are there other sites to help uh, help identify those connections that you know of? Yeah, there's a zillion places nowadays. Um, LinkedIn sites for sure. Um, there are associations. You can physically go to associations, which is a good thing to do, and go to their meetings. Um, and virtual meetings also online, uh, uh, you know, specific groups within, within LinkedIn. And um, the aim is, I'll give you a general rule, if, it's, uh, if you're changing, changing industries, changing careers, you're initially perceived, and rightfully so, as an outsider. Because you don't know the people, you don't know the language, you don't know the values. And, and the more that you associate with these people, the more you can become an insider. You speak the language, you know who's who, read their publications, attend their meetings, and uh, look, look at their literature, be involved in their society, so to speak, and then you become an insider. And uh, then when you go for an interview and you speak like an insider, that enhances your, poss your, your possibility of being offered very, very much. OK, great. Um, thank you. Another um, tactical question. We talked about uh, engaging uh, people at the targeted company. Someone's asking, uh, you know, how do I lead effectively? Do I lead with I'm looking for a job at your company, or do you suggest a more indirect approach? How would you suggest that that? Oh. Uh, that uh, uh, so we suggest never to lead with "I'm looking for a, for a job," and uh, why? It's a closed-ended question, as opposed to doing research, asking for their opinion, their strategic 
vision on a certain issue, which is an open-ended question. A closed-ended question because either he'll say yes or no, he'll feel very uncomfortable, and it's not the way of developing an ongoing relationship, um, which is what we need. And we said also, we're not targeting openings that limits us only to 10 to 20 percent of the opportunities. We want to rather build a network of ongoing contacts, which will get us towards the other 80 percent of the opportunities. Okay, great. Um, someone's um, asking a question, and, and, and this could be with a job interview, um, or you know, or just um, in speaking with with your network and getting some professional advice. You know, if if there's an interviewer um, or there's some of your network who says, "I don't think you're uh, the the right fit for the position," um, is there a way advice you can give for helping people kind of get past that and get more specific feedback, and you know, and, and really um, get get some good advice out of that to to improve their their, their value proposition and, and the way they present that? Yeah, so that's a great question. We deal with such a thing later on in a segment on interviewing, I think. Anyway, I'll tell you a few things over here. Um, anytime you go on an interview, some of the most important information that you want to get is, do they have any hesitation, any objections? to hiring somebody like myself as a candidate. Now, many clients hear this and they, they get, oh, what do you mean? I can ask that. You want to bring that up? Well, the objections are there whether you bring it up or not. The only question is if you go away ignorant or if you go away knowledgeable. If you go away knowing what the objections are, then you have a chance of overcoming those objections. Some type of objections you could overcome, some you can't. Right. If they want a lady for the position, I'm a man, I cannot overcome that. But if uh, they want somebody with certain training and I don't have it, I can get it. Or maybe I have it and they didn't realize it, I didn't present myself well. So there are many, many types of objections that I could overcome and I want to know about it. So if I could politely um, pursue this person who said, I don't think it's a right, it's a fit, and know why. There may be some uh, valid reason that he has, and there may be some um, way that I could explain to him that that won't be an objection, that won't be a problem. Right? Maybe he looks at me, thinks I'm too old, I'm not going to fit in the culture over here. And I'll give him an example. That the last place that I worked, the people were even younger, and we fit in great, and, they were, and we had respect for each other, what, whatever it might be. You want to be able to find out what the objections are, if not from this person, maybe from somebody else, and uh, so then you can be able to respond to them and try to overcome them. Okay, great. And this might not be specifically on our webinar topic, but it's a, I think it's a great question uh, as well. I'm kind of on the, you know, let's let's say for the sake of argument um, that you go in, you know, uh, to the company and you're not um, offered a position. Um, is, is there a way to, to spin that and make sure that that company becomes a possibility in the future? Is there a way not to write off that company? Oh, I'm glad you asked because I meant to say that as part of the answer to the previous question, 100%, that's for sure. Yeah. What to do with an interview if it doesn't end up in an offer, keep in touch with that company. And um, <laughs> the Five O'Clock Club has a story, a guy, they, there were two, two candidates. One, it was a tough decision between these two candidates. One was hired, and uh, Michael was not hired, but um, Michael wrote back such a nice letter that I'm sure you made the right decision. But I want you to know that I, I would love to work for your company, and please keep me in mind. And a few months later, he wrote, and he said, I'm working at such and such a place, and it's a good job, but I, I really like your company, and uh, like to keep in touch, and please keep me in mind. And the next time that they hired, they didn't bother to take resumes. They called from Michael and, and, and hired him, under, and they brought him in. Uh, so keep in touch. That's one thing. Um, another thing that can be done when an interview does not end up, it's obviously it's not going to end up in hiring you, is use that as a networking meeting and ask them if there are other positions that they might suggest for you uh, that they might know about. Um, I think I had a third thing. I don't know. OK. We'll come back to it, I guess, by the interviewing. Yes. OK. Great. Um, you know, it seems like you're, you know, you're very well connected, and, and you talk with quite a few people. 
and especially in, in the arena of how to target your next job, can you give us some generalizations of what you see uh, you know, as, as the most common uh, mistakes uh, that people make? And then for someone uh, who's getting started, kind of an ancillary question, um, how, how do they make this uh, a little bit uh, less daunting you know, in, in getting that process started? Okay, <laughs> big, big questions. Um, one mistake is um, not starting from the beginning. Right? The previous webinar was called Look Forward by Looking Back. Um, look forward to your next job and the one after that by looking back at your accomplishments to discover your skills and your passions. Um, that's not only for somebody who's starting out. It's, it's also for somebody who's been 20 years in a particular industry and plans to spend the next 20 years in the same industry. Because without doing that, he may be missing important skills that he has that he can offer. He may be missing important accomplishments that he can use, which would be very compelling to put on his resume, to put in his pitch. So that's a mistake um, commonly made. People think, I don't have to look back. I know what I'm doing, and I know where I'm going. But it gives you gold. It gives you a lot of valuable data to use in positioning yourself for something that you'd be able to do successfully and showing them that you could do it successfully because you have these accomplishments to show them. That's one of the mistakes. And um, just one more in terms of today's discussion. Um, to map your skills to the types of jobs and types of cultural setting where you're likely to be most successful. Um, don't be focused only on who's going to hire me. Be focused on where will my skills matter, where will they be useful, where will I be able to flourish and, and be comfortable, be in an environment which is one where I, where I can work well and appreciate each other. So once you've mapped to uh, those positions where you're most likely to be successful, the rest of the process goes much more easily because you're on track. Right? If you've not mapped to the right um, targets, then it's not going to go easy. I gave an example recently, a speech about resumes. A resume is like a key. The key can be well made, but if it wasn't made to open this door, <laughs> the door is not going to open. Right? You have to be targeting those positions that your skills and passions enable you to do very successfully. Okay, great. And then uh, just real quickly, um, you know, back to my um, other question, and it's probably not an easy answer here, but I talk to people, uh, you know, in this arena as well, and sometimes people just uh, seem to be, you know, overwhelmed um, by the prospect of, you know, finding these 200 companies. Um, is there any, you know, advice you have to make this a little bit less daunting to them? Yeah, I have people who tell me that they're 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 stuck, they're frozen. Do a little bit. Spend five minutes. Write down something. Come up with three targets and start close, right? Write down some positions which are close to the one that you're doing. You don't even need brilliant brainstorming. Things that are closely related to what you've been doing, to what you want to be doing. Write down three either industries, three companies, wherever you're up to, and even if they don't end up to be the ones that uh, you're going to pursue. They may, you may rank them to the bottom, but at least you broke the ice and you got started the next they do three more. And another rule of thumb, very important for job seekers, is have a buddy. Have a job seeker buddy. Some people um, attend regular weekly group sessions, which they pay for. Some people hire a coach. But even without that, if you get a friend that you're going to make, daily contact is the best. But even a weekly contact, you know you're going to have to check in with him next Monday and report back because this Monday you had two items on your to-do list. You're going to have to face them next Monday. Well, did you do it? <laughs> Either you're going to say yes, you have to make excuses. And it, the encouragement um, it, it accomplishes a lot. It helps very much to have a job search buddy because sometimes it's a drag. You have to make all those phone calls, send out those emails, record all the, the things that transpired. You have somebody to help you share it with. And, 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 and somebody to report to that, that helps you to, to keep the momentum going. 
So uh, thank you very much. Uh, with that, be mindful of our time. I'd like to uh, close the Q&A session. Uh, we'd like to thank Moshe for his time and very valuable insights. Uh, for the attendees, if you would like to connect uh, with him, please indicate that on a survey. We'll be asking you to take immediately at the conclusion of the webinar. He is definitely a leader in his field and an excellent resource of information for today's topics. Again, as we noted earlier, if you're interested in CPE credits, please send an email to twalshatperformative.com in order to receive your CPE certificate. Again, please note, after we conclude the webinar, you'll be prompted to take a short survey regarding the webinar. We greatly appreciate your feedback regarding our event today as we always strive to improve the ROI we offer our event attendees for your valuable time. Uh, finally, I would like to thank the audience uh, for, your, for your time. I hope that you all uh, have a great weekend. We hope to see you uh, on Performative very soon. Thank you very much, everyone.